Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Vagabond Dog Industry Chats. This week, we have Daniel Sadowski, who is a creative director, a writer, designer, and a producer currently working on a game called Growing Up for Vile Monarch. How are you doing? Welcome to the show. Did I, did I miss anything hey, in those titles? No, no, probably not. But uh, yeah, I definitely do too much. Uh, I need to do something about it soon. <laughs> It, because it's it's hard, you know, doing the job of free people uh, at the same time. So yeah. it's that's 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 indie life for you, though. Um... Yeah, exactly. It's 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 the curse of small teams and indie mm -hmm. teams that you really need to wear many hats in order to you know to ship a game. So. The, 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 I always find the funny thing about it in particular is that you you have to do you have to be a jack of all trades, but you also kind of if you want to succeed have to master all of them as well. You know, you can't do a mediocre job at each of the things that you try. You have to kind of like land it re over and over again, no matter what it is. Um, yeah, that's true. Uh, and especially when you're leading the project and, you know, all the responsibilities on your hands for whether or not it succeeds or is delivered on time, then, then yeah, there's just no way around it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's tough. Um, uh, you're currently working on a game called Growing Up, which I, I exactly. can best describe as a sort of narrative life sim uh experience v focused on uh i get growing up uh, uh can you can we can you tell us a bit more about it sure sure so as you said it's a life simulator simulator a hard word apparently uh in which you basically can play yourself so you are born and you grow up Year by year, you go to preschool, then to elementary school, then to middle school, high school. You meet many friends, you learn new things, and you pretty much have to decide who you will become, you know, as, a, as an adult. So uh, from birth till 18 years old, you can play this game any way you like. Right. That's It's a really interesting uh, concept. I, I love life simulation. Uh, a lot of what I... Uh, built in my last big game was life simulation stuff. Um, I I focused a lot on like the minutia of day to day living. Like there's a lot, when people say life simulation, there's like a really big spectrum. Of, it sounds like one genre, but there's a really big spectrum of like what life yeah. simulation can be. You can go from something like my game where it's about like eating your food, then washing your hands, then going to the washroom, then making sure you sleep, then going to the gym, going, then talking to your friends, and like all these little little tiny things to something. So like we're that. not that detailed, right? <laughs> right. Or, In simulating life. <laughs> but yes, I mean, I'm I'm simulating a month. You're simulating years and years and years and years. Um, or or a life simulator can be like uh, like spore, right? Where it's literal, you know, the 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 microorganism growing and growing into yeah evolution uh, stuff, yeah. right? Um, what about the idea of of simulating life in games is interesting to you personally? Uh, well, the choices first of all, you know, having the freedom to decide uh, what happens next, and that's something that we really really wanted to showcase in growing up. Uh, that there are some tough choices that you have to make, you know, when you go through life, especially as a child, as a kid, or and then as a teenager. And uh, we definitely wanted to show that, yeah, you can screw up a lot. So you really need to be careful, you know, how you interact with your friends, teachers, parents, because it's really easy to screw up relationships mm -hmm. in real life. And in our game, it's sometimes as simple as in real life as well. So for me, that's that's you know the the, the most interesting thing, like showing you know these these, these different choices that you can make. Um, but also, uh, what we wanted to do, you know, in the genre, is also create a sort of system that makes sure that each life you get. Is completely different so you will meet completely different people uh in each of your first playthroughs so of course then it, the, the content starts recycling so to speak because mm -hmm. yeah we couldn't do an infinite amount right. of content for the game but uh yeah you will meet different people in every playthrough so a, a different set of people so to speak right yeah that's the, that's the uh inevitable balance between uh, you know, like what, what separates uh, a, a, like a, a visual novel game from 
a, a simulation the the chaos factor um that is re i think is super important to a life simulation you know if if you can have the same simulation as your friend exactly like is this really a simulation or am i just going through the through the motions um yeah yeah exactly so we we wanted to to you know to give as many options to the player as possible so also in in the way you know which skills you learn during uh, during your time at school uh what can your hobbies be you know who you can aspire to be uh and it all also reflects in the game's endings so there are many 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 like tens of different different professions you can end up with as an adult depending on how well you do in the game and also depending on what you practice more or less so you know it's it's all about choice and freedom to basically discover who you will be right with with so many uh variables and potentialities in the game that comes along it, with the narrative focus of it comes along with a lot of writing i'm curious how you as a writer and uh, and a producer manage that much content generation um with a small team because it's something i think yeah. a lot of indies struggle with yeah so luckily i didn't have to write much for this game uh which is good because then i would not be able to do any of my other work <laughs> we actually had three wonderful white writers working with us uh, on growing up uh one of them is christian divine uh, the lead writer on life is strange series mm -hmm. uh, then we had emma vicelli uh, who is a comic book writer and she also by a very very weird coincidence she's writing life is strange comic books <laughs> and and then we had by another really weird coincidence, we had Matthew Ritter, who also worked with Don't Nod, uh, but not on Life is Strange games, but on Twin Mirror. So, yeah, the people somehow were connected to each other, you know, in a mysterious way. So we had these three really wonderful writers who each uh, took a part of the writing duties during Growing Up's production. Mm -hmm. So pretty much uh, each of them took a different set of characters, events, scenes to write. And yeah, you'll get uh, a character by Kristen Devine. You'll get a couple of characters written by Emma. And then you'll get a lot of characters written by Matthew. So, so they did most of the work. Uh, in this game, I didn't do too much writing, as I mentioned, which, is, which, which was good for me. But uh, yeah, I also wrote a couple of uh, minor scenes just to make sure... We had everything we needed, you know, also mm -hmm. from the gameplay perspective, because I was sort of in this game also in the role of the uh, designer and the narrative designer. So I had to make sure we had all of the scenes uh, needed to, um, you know, have everything uh, for the gameplay, especially for the ending. So uh, when there was something missing, yeah, instead of just uh, asking the writers who were very, very busy with, with a lot of remaining work, I just wrote a couple of additional scenes, so, right. which was fun. That's, I didn't realize you had, I mean, that's by my standards, uh, a pretty big, uh, writing team. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. used, I'm used to, we have one writer and like maybe one, uh, contract writer for a position, but that's, I mean, I guess with that much narrative content, it's really important to have so many people. Um, the question, yeah, it was really fun. Yeah. To have such a big team. Uh, previously <laughs> I, on the previous games, I had one additional writer to work with usually. Mm -hmm. Uh, which was enough uh, for those games, but uh, here it was really, really cool seeing, you know, the, the whole writing team working together, coming up, you know, with the stories for different characters. Awesome stuff, really. The, um, the, it's interesting that the, when I had assumed it was just you writing, the, uh, the question I was going to ask is, um, with life simulation, like, you kind of have to pull a bit outside of yourself and and kind of regard life from this third you know bird's eye perspective because you as a human have only experienced one life simulation yeah and to effectively write authentic um experiences within a life simulation you need to uh develop a lot of empathy or um you know uh, be hyper analytical about you know the way things can go mm -hmm. um but I guess now that, uh, you know, I, I understand the, the dynamic of the team a little bit more, I'm curious how you as a producer um, assign uh, writing tasks um, to make it effective and authentic, uh, you know, and, and deliver that quality product with the, with the writing. 
Sure. Uh, so uh, let me go back a bit to to some of the first things you said mm -hmm. uh, about you know collecting experiences and having lived only one life. So what we did at the very beginning of the game, we did a tons of research. So uh, we you know played other life simulation games to see you know how they were doing different stuff you know both from the gameplay perspective and from the narrative perspective so we collected you know all the data analyzed it to sort of uh, see what worked what didn't work what resonated with us what didn't um, and then we actually started uh, collecting quite a lot of you know ideas and experiences from the team uh, so at the very very beginning we actually brainstormed quite a lot to to just you know collect ideas and um you know um also scenes from life so to speak or events from life that that different people experienced so we could see like what could fit our game and what could fit the topic you know of growing up and growing up in school with with different kinds of parents uh, what kind of different experiences we would like to, to, you know, to show what different kinds of problems that the kids can have. Uh, we also wanted, you know, to, to show a lot of those things in the game. So we will deal with depression. We will deal in growing up, you know, with uh, eating disorders, actually bullying, um, yeah, death of family members. So there are a lot of really heavy uh, story elements that we tied into, you know, these different stories of the different characters that we'll have in the game. And of course, uh, yeah, we watched a lot of movies, TV shows, and just stole tons and tons of, you know, ideas uh, from these things as well, you know, just to get inspired and, uh, and yeah, come up with, with some new cool stuff that we could use in the game. So... So that's how we, you know, collected all of the different ideas. And then what we did, we created a couple of really, really huge spreadsheets, especially for the friend characters that you'll meet in the game. And we actually wrote down, you know, in detail who these characters are. So, yeah, what is their gender, of course? What is their sexual orientation? Because you can have a romantic relationship later in the game when you're in high school with these characters as well. Um, and we also, you know, wanted each of these characters to have unique um, stories and unique real life topics that, um, um, that would happen during, you know, the, the different scenes and the different stories. So we, we really spent a lot of time to make sure that, that each character was unique and that they all sort of complemented each other. So no matter which set of characters you get, it'll be interesting, it'll be varied. Um, yeah. Uh, and then as far as, you know, dividing the work, uh, first of all, I, I'm going to get a little bit technical here, you know, from the production standpoint. Uh, I can go into really a lot of detail. Not, not, not sure how much you want here. Go for it. It's, it's, great. it's good information. Yeah. yeah, sure. So uh, what we did with the writers, we first, um, what we did first uh, was create this, these uh, summary sheets for each of the characters. So mm -hmm. these sheets were quite long. They were like five or six, six pages long in the end, but they contained quite a long list of different questions that the writers had to answer about these characters. So like, uh, who is this character? You know, what is their family background? What are their interests? What is their personality? And with the personality, we always wanted to already create some inner conflict. So a character would be X, but Y. So for example, a character can be intelligent, uh, but annoying or something mm -hmm. like that. So one positive, one negative uh, personality trait for each character um, and the other questions that they had to answer uh, were also about, you know, what what, uh, what do they do in school? What are their favorite subjects? What they like to do, what they don't like to do, et cetera, et cetera. It was quite a long list. Um, so that was the first thing that they did. And they we, we divided the workflow evenly. So each of the writers uh, got three to four characters to sort of summarize in these sheets and already they also had to sort of propose um suggest you know what plot lines 
these characters would have in different schools because growing up is divided into different stages. So each different school is a different stage, a different gameplay stage where we also introduce new gameplay mechanics. So, um, so they basically for different characters, they had to come up with a different amount of stories because some of the characters we meet in the elementary school, mm -hmm. some of the characters we'll meet only in high school. So yeah, some of these characters could have three different story arcs, some one story arc. Yeah. And they had to prepare all of that. Once we had, you know, all of these character sheets ready. The next thing we did was pretty much talk with them about how much time they have to actually write all of the scenes. And that was quite a lot of work because uh, all of the scenes are branching uh, and the stories are really, really complicated. And uh, yeah, sometimes you actually get completely different scenes depending on which, uh, you know, choices you made. Uh, many, many scenes before, so the, the you know, the, the story trees were insane in, in some of the characters. Right. So that was quite a lot of work. Um, all in all, I think they managed to write one whole story arc for one school in like one to two weeks. So that was, that was quite fast, actually, uh, on their end. But... Uh, yeah, then we basically had to divide the, the workflow of actually writing the scenes and the stories um, depending on how much time they had. So they all had, you know, also different responsibilities, different contracts that uh, they were doing uh, while working with us on growing up. So some of the writers ended up writing uh, a smaller amount of characters. Mm -hmm. And for example, Matthew Ritter, I think he wrote like more than a half of all of the characters and scenes in the game. So he did a lot, a lot of work uh, in the game. Mm -hmm. It's interesting hearing about uh, the uh, uh, inspiration period, right? Where you're going through references and you're um, sort of curating a, a collection of interesting moments because it's... It, 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 especially when it's a narrative life simulator, you're kind of having to strike this, I find sometimes odd balance between um, uh, creating an interesting narrative experience and the purity of life simulation. In real life, sometimes a whole life can be kind of boring, right? Like a person who doesn't, you know, uh, have a lot of exciting things happen to them in their life or... You know, I mean, everybody has stuff happen to them, but not in necessarily a traditional narrative arc or or you or or you know, d shining narrative moments that we kind of seek in video games. So I'm curious yeah. how you choose to balance the the purists version of a life simulator where it's totally possible to have like the most boring uh, experience ever versus you know the other end of the spectrum where it's so you know exciting and narratively uh, crafted where it stops feeling like a life simulator and it feels more like uh you know a, a storybook yeah so uh i think it was actually brandon sanderson that uh, wrote, that wrote that uh, when you are in doubt uh, you should err on the side of what's cool and he was actually <laughs> referring to his system of magic Right. Uh, but that, that's what we did, you know, uh, when we were having doubts about, you know, going one way or the other, we sort of chose what was cool. You know, this game, even though it's a life simulator, it um, sort of behaves uh, like, you know, uh, a movie or a AAA title in that it has a, you know, a beginning, a middle and a very specific end. So we needed to structure the game. Um, also to to be almost like you know in in stories a free or a five act structure um so um so there is no way to have a boring life pretty much in right. this game uh even if you really mess up because you can mess up in such a way that you will end up with no friends whatsoever by the end of the game there is still so much to do in the right. meantime you know skills to learn uh work to do you know to earn money to buy additional stuff in stores uh so there there's you know a lot of also exploration in the game's world when where you can actually meet uh, additional characters that give you new skills that you can learn so even if you end up you know with 
little to no story because you sort of antagonized all of the friends you met uh, yeah. during your during your life. Uh, the game still throws enough content at you to be interesting. Um, so we we made a very conscious choice to make sure the game is never boring and always keeps you on your toes because otherwise you know if the game was boring what's the point of playing at right. least you know that's that's my opinion right right yeah I, I, even in the socially ostracized path there's still the inherent drama of those yeah. fail, failed relationships and everything yeah well. it's all, also interesting you know to to see like okay I, I i ended up with no friends in growing up so what is going to happen in the ending you know yeah, who am I going to become as a character? Will I have a, a spouse or not? You know, will I have a kid? It's it's interesting to see. So, uh... the one of the this is how do I bring this? One of the things that I like to explore with with life simulation and giving player choice is that not every player approaches the game experience with aspirational goals. Sometimes players like to be self-destructive to their avatars. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> do you uh, take that into consideration? Like, what... Yeah. What, <laughs> just... yeah. Yeah, yeah, we do. It's yeah, fun. we do. There was, yeah, there was, you know, this, uh, this running joke we had, uh, especially during, during the Trump administration uh, in the U.S., um, that... You can actually have a child that will not learn anything and you can still become the president of the United States. <laughs> Perfect. So, yeah, uh, of course, it's hard to, to, to get the, to be the president without learning anything in our game. But uh, um, we do take into account, you know, the destructive paths. So if you do not take care of your mental health, for example, or you do not take care of your relationship with your parents, you will end up with some very, very bad endings in the game. And also, yeah, if you do not concentrate on, you know, your schoolwork, you don't learn anything, you don't practice your skills, you fail your exams uh, during the game, you will also end up with uh, some bad endings. So, well, maybe not bad, but... Uh, less epic so to speak all the endings are interesting some right. are simply less epic and more mundane that that's how i would uh, describe them so yeah there's a lot of stuff that you can do and uh, we try to take a lot of you know different play styles into consideration so both people who will play casually and also people who will play hardcore they should be able to get a lot of satisfaction from the game but they will get you know different endings different results uh, and different stuff will happen to them in the game so yeah right um i find uh, with life simulation i mean all all narrative is ultimately projection from from the creator but life simulation is a very unique sort of projection it is a projection of your worldview right how you think the mechanics of the world function what you think the outcomes of uh you know specific courses of action are uh, do you take any steps to uh, uh address that or or uh, as a creator it's something that i i struggled with quite uh, extensively in trying to uh, you know hold the best mirror you can up to reality to and reflect that in your game uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, there's a lot of research that, uh, you know, goes into the games that uh, I produce. So that, that's all, always the first step for me, you know, before I make any judgments about what I want to make or how I want to make it. Um, I really, really do a lot of research to to make sure that I understand what I'm actually trying to do and why it works or why it doesn't. Um, and um, for growing up, we actually... We actually had a couple of uh, rules that um, helped us decide what will fit the game and what has no place, you know, in this game. So uh, we, the growing up is actually based on on another game called Chinese Parents. I'm not sure if you've heard about it, but uh, both Chinese Parents and Growing Up are actually uh, published by the same publisher. So uh, gotcha. any similarities between the two games are. Uh, very, very uh, much not a coincidence. 
Gotcha. Um, so the so, so basically the first thing that that we had in our rule book was that we do not want to make a copy of Chinese parents, but uh, we also do not want to you know create a huge revolution. So it was evolution, not revolution, mm -hmm. and. We also wanted to concentrate more on the kids' lives and not on parents as it was in Chinese parents. So that was also something that helped us, you know, decide what kinds of stuff to show in the game and what kind of stuff to cut. Um, so we really, really focused here, you know, on the on the experiences that the kids have uh, or can have at school and with their parents. Uh, yeah. Not sure that answers your question fully. No, uh, I it, I mean, it, it gets it gets some of the idea. Uh, yeah. I guess let's take a step back and 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 go back to this uh, fact that you have to wear fifteen different hats, <laughs> um, may, in producing this game. Um, how did that start for you? A lot of a lot of people enter the games industry with a specific talent set, um, and become experts in in their field and you know either do tons of contract work or get a staff position on a certain company um how did you enter what did you enter the industry as and how did that uh change over time sure uh so basically in in game development years uh i'll turn 15 this november so i've been working in the industry for almost you know 15 years now and i actually started as a programmer Mm -hmm. on the very first Witcher game at CG Project Red. So I worked at CG Project for almost two years on, on the first Witcher and also the Witcher Enhanced Edition. But back then I was uh, just a programmer. Um, then uh, for the next 10 or 11 years, actually, I run my, my own studio, Nitrial Games. Uh, and there, Sort of naturally, by division of labor, I ended up uh, mostly doing, you know, producing, production, design, and writing work on all of the games that we released, um, and that's how I pretty much ended up, I guess, in this in this uh, sort of curse of uh, having to live the life of three different people, you know, during each and every project I was making. Um, uh, and, and yeah, it's it, it's fun sometimes because you know, as a designer, you sort of work to make the best game that you can with you know as many ideas, as many features as possible. But as a producer, you have to cut a lot of stuff, you know. So sometimes it it, it, it uh, created very interesting conversations that I had, you know, in my own head, so to speak, where I had to sort of negotiate with negotiate with myself whether or not we should. Add something or cut something or stuff like that. So uh, um, at the end of uh, 2019, we made the decision to shut down Etrial Games. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up at Val Monarch. We sort of decided, I, kn I knew the guys who were running, you know, Val Monarch for years uh, before I started working with them. So we were quite good friends. And uh, yeah, they were just. Uh, planning to do growing up and they needed someone to lead that project. So that's, that's when I uh, stepped in, you know, to take over the project and uh, make it a reality, so to speak. And uh, I should have known better actually by the time, but I still ended up, you know, as a, as a creative director slash project leader slash designer slash producer, basically too many hats you know for uh, for one person to handle uh, it's 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 really something that I, I would like to limit you know in the next project and to definitely do less uh, stuff at the same time right it, it, um, I'm curious how you divide yourself effectively then like um, do you keep the producer brain and the designer brain simultaneously while, uh, while you're you know doing your design work or do you shut that part off and go 100% design, be as big as possible, and then deal with the ramifications later? What is what's your process like? Um, basically, I learned to divide my time in the week, you know, between different duties. So uh, by the end of growing up, uh, I had two days, full days set aside as uh, you know for production duties. So I would speak, you know, with the team. During these days, uh, plan the next sprints, also manage um, 
some necessary you know contact with the publisher um and then the next three days i would concentrate on the design duties so um checking for example the scripts for the next character that we were adding to the game or doing some leftover design work that was still necessary to uh to be done before the game's end so and, and that works quite well for me because i really don't like you know jumping from topic to topic too much especially if if different topics require completely different mental states to handle them because you know as a designer you have to be creative you have to sit down give yourself space and time to brainstorm to come up with stuff to sort of uh, have these little you know conversations with yourself about what works what doesn't work and uh, try to find you know as many different ways to to solve some kind of a design problem uh, while as a producer it's it's more down to earth work where you pretty much have to see you know check the schedules all the time make sure that we are on track on time check what other people are doing whether they are you know doing stuff on time and on track uh, react to any unforeseen circumstances new bugs that appear for example that totally uh, you know mess up with with the plans that we have so so as I said, I, I eventually learned to divide my week uh, specifically to different duties on different days uh, because that's what uh, turned out to be most effective for me personally. Uh, I found that when I tried to you know, mix production and design duties during the same day of work, then I really did not feel I was, you know, as efficient in in any of them. Of course, some unforeseen circumstances sometimes happen that uh, I had to change, you know, my plans during the day. But uh, uh, for the most part, I tried to, you know, divide my workflow, um, you know, different stuff on a different day, and and, and that worked. Yeah. I I I wear a whole closet full of hats because I'm obsessed with the control. <laughs> I, I I have a hard time letting go of it. I, I got to have my fingers in everything. And, and Yeah, that's something you have to learn. Yeah, I was there also right. in the past. And uh, yeah, step uh, by you, step, you just need to let go. Okay. I, I, I really get the sense that, that you, if given the option, would, would prefer to have a, a singular focus role. Do you think you can transition out yeah. of where you are now? And how would you go about doing that? Yeah, that's something actually I'm working on right now. Uh, basically, growing up is pretty much done. So right now, I'm only visiting Val Monarch once a week to to make sure you know uh, the last bits that are left to do, like localization, mobile issues uh, or platform specific issues are being handled, you know, and uh, also taking care of some communication with the publisher. Um, so there is, you know, not much work left to do. So I decided to take a, a sabbatical now from, you know, working on bigger projects. Uh, and especially since my second son was born in May, I also thought about, you know, taking more personal time for myself. Uh, so I'm using, you know, that opportunity that now I really can just relax and not have to rush with anything to, to also plan the next steps, you know, in my career. So one of the things that I'm also thinking about and trying to sort out is how to limit the amount of things that uh, I could be doing, you know, on future projects. And uh, yeah, I already decided that uh, what's most interesting to me are narrative uh, topics. Mm -hmm. So, you know, narrative design, uh, story creation, also a little bit of writing, uh, although, yeah, I, I didn't really need to write all the scenes in the game um, to, you know, to feel satisfied about about my work on, on the game. I also enjoy a lot of, you know, gameplay design work. Uh, so the first thing that I will probably be, you know, doing less on future projects uh, is going to be actually production work. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's my first step, you know, uh, to take to limit the amount of hats that uh, I would like to wear in the future. Because yeah, I'm too old for that, to be honest. You know, I'm too old to 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 really uh, try to do everything in a project, and I shouldn't be doing that. You know, the the, the team should be handling most of the stuff, not me. So so why do I even you know try to to wear so many hats at the same time, right? 
Right. It, it, it's a weird thing with, and I, I can't speak a lot to this personally, but um, I see a lot of uh, my peers, you know, who have careers in the games industry, right? It, it, it very much comes down to opportunities available and then filling that need, you know, because we all are really passionate, right? We all really want to work in games and, and make cool stuff. And sometimes the opportunity comes and there's just no other way to be part other than taking on more than you're really capable or willing to do. Um, do you have any advice for people? I mean, having having done this yourself, has there any advice for, for, for younger people starting their careers to avoid taking on a lot of roles or, or tasks that they're, they don't necessarily want to see themselves doing long term? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very hard uh, question, actually, uh, because it all depends on, you know, what the project is and uh, how much time you have for the project, how big of a budget you have uh, for the project. There are projects, uh, and I've worked on a couple like those as well, with, where there's simply no way, for example, to uh, hire someone new to take additional responsibility mm -hmm. because there's just no budget for that. And uh, in in such a situation, there is really no other choice just to take a deep breath and do what needs to be done in order to complete the game. And uh, the, the same is true when, for example, you are nearing, you know, final milestones and there is no more time, you know, to to delay anything, or there is nothing else that you can cut from the game, and you simply have to finish. These situations are tough, and I've made it, you know, a point uh, in my career to avoid such situations as much as possible, uh, because you know, crunch is really, really bad and damaging to to everyone, you know, to to people, to organizations, and also the quality of the game itself mm -hmm. suffers a lot when you have to do too much overtime uh, on it. So um, that's why I also always, you know, take a lot of time at the beginning of the project to plan as much in advance as possible, you know, breaking down the game into the smallest of features, trying to estimate as much as I can just to see, you know, where will I possibly be in half a year or a year uh, from where I am now, right? Because if I see that already uh i'm not going to make it uh, on time with everything planned and i have a lot of extra time to react um and change course or pivot so so that would be i think uh my first advice you know to to people working on on projects um just make sure you know what you're getting into as early as possible just you know, open Excel, write down all the features that you want to see in the game, try to estimate them and see, you know, if you are able to deliver the, the whole game on time with the team you have. If yes, that's great. But if you already see that you don't have enough people, you don't have enough time, then the earlier you will react to, to that problem by either, you know, changing the scope of the game or um trying to do things differently or trying to get more people involved right. the easier it will be to finish the game and as a result the less hats you'll have to wear you know by the time the project is uh, nearing completion so i think that that would be you know my advice here extensive planning ahead of time it's it, it, it feeds into yeah. this thing though um Industry-wide, we all want uh, uh, to, to limit crunch and, um, you know, to, to make sure that there's, an, uh, there's enough budget and things are proportioned and everything uh, appropriately. Um, but there's this, you know, uh, constant conflict in the industry between the idealism of those goals and the, the reality of situation. Because I've seen projects, incredibly well-planned, I've had incredibly well-planned <laughs> projects <laughs> that all of a sudden, you know, there's some one, two things that, oh, no, this is not a two week job. This is a yeah. three month job. Crap. And, you know, even if you had a buffer budget, you know, a whole month, uh, that's not enough to cover this distance. And you've already started. And, you know, is there 
is it is it just an inevitability then with with when it comes to making games or any, any I think ga- I I can't imagine a lot of other art form. I mean, I guess film ha- can have these issues technical technical issues on set or whatever, but um is this is this just also an unavoidable thing where, you know, best laid plans often just get washed away? Yeah, I I think it is actually uh because you know games uh as you mentioned they they are very close you know to 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 movies uh in the way they are made because they also require you know a lot of different moving parts that can change during production. Uh one of the things because I also spent you know like 7 years teaching students uh you know game development at the local academy in Warsaw. Um, and the, the thing I always told them is that they never should compare creating games to IT projects mm. because IT projects, you know, at, at, at some point they become similar, you know, when you're making the, the 10th, 20th, uh, application for a bank or whatever, or a customer right. management application. Yeah. Then you, you can sort of foresee, you know, the scope of the project because a, a lot of that project is more about doing something practical uh, and technical and less about being creative and games and movies uh, and music as well you know these are very very creative arts and um, it's just like with stories you know when you sit down to write a book the first draft is never the end of your work then you sit down to write the second the third the fourth draft and then maybe the book will be actually good enough you know to to have someone read it or, or actually get published. So, mm-hmm. uh, the same is, is true with games. There is, there is, it's, I think it's impossible really to, uh, foresee at the very beginning of production, how the game will end up, because even if you are 100% sure, which you never should be, uh, that some feature will work because it works on paper, there may, there may be, you know, a situation where yeah, it, it simply won't be fun. It works, but it's not fun and you need to change it. And there was, for example, a lot of stuff like that in growing up that we, you know, designed. We are pretty sure that this would be okay, but then we ended up, you know, changing it uh, even a couple of times, like the whole skill system, for example, in growing up, I think it had like four or five iterations mm-hmm. during the whole production. Um, because we are constantly looking for, you know, what's, the most fun way, you know, to do that system. And, and I think that's, that's the main reason why it's inevitable that uh, you will end up having, you know, a lot of problems during production. But I think that's also, you know, the far, fun part of, of making games, you know, expecting these problems and dealing them and solving them. Like for me, you know, solving problems, coming up with solutions to seemingly impossible scenarios uh is really satisfying and mm-hmm. um and also you can always cut something out there there's always something you can cut out you know there's of the, the game the and the game will not suffer yeah exactly there's so, the producer so, yeah it, it's i think it's all about uh at least you know for me it's all about just being aware of of um how things can go wrong and and preparing for that in advance uh, because if you do, then it will be easier for you to handle. Uh, because if you just try to ignore, you know, potential problems uh, or just, you know, go into game development like YOLO and whatever, we'll see how it goes, then you're just asking for trouble. And I've been there. I, I've run, you know, projects, my first projects at Neutral Games when I was always also, you know, learning how to be a, a good producer and a, and a good team manager and you know how to handle schedules yeah i messed up so many times and yeah we also did a couple of games like yeah let's see how it goes you know without much planning but we learned the very very hard way that that's not the way to do and uh, we very quickly started you know uh, estimating stuff scheduling stuff more because it helped us make a better job and it actually made making games much much easier just you know, predicting all, all the possible problems that uh, that can happen. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've sort of, I, I, I've sort of slowly fallen into the hyper scheduled uh, routine myself. Um, yeah, but you need to be careful because you know when you when you start sort of trying to foresee 
what can go wrong uh, you suddenly ed- end end up in in sort of this like hell uh, that you see problems everywhere and you right. start to worry about everything that can possibly happen so you need to make sure there's you know balance in in the work you do as well uh, because I, not, not not every situation will actually come to pass so right the, I, I feel like um like we definitely had a yolo phase where it was just you know anything goes um but i would i I was conscious of the fact that there was no way we could do all of the things that we wanted to do or I wanted all the games I wanted to make today. And I feel like now that I'm in a similar, more uh, scheduled and routine and and producer style um, phase and mentality, I, my creativity has, has kind of faded a little bit and I'm relying on a lot of ideas that I had generated and stored away um, during that younger phase of my development career. Um, and now I'm making them, actualizing them uh, through this method. And, and I'm, I'm curious if you think maybe is that a part, is that a part of not the game, but growing up, like the, 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 <laughs> the, 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 the growing the, up as a game developer. The, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, how does, um, do we have creative periods in our life and non-creative periods in our life or is it a throughput or how, how do you, how do you view that as somebody who's, who's, you know, sort of floated through the spectrum as, uh, as your career has gone on? Yeah, I think, you know, creativity is, uh, is, is like a garden. You have to tend to it. Uh, yeah. If you, if you give it, you know, too little attention, it will just fade away. And if you just, try to force you know yourself to be hyper creative you'll quickly burn out uh, mm-hmm. so th- there there's need to be balance but but you need to uh, sort of work on yourself you know if if you want to be uh, still creative after you know years of, of game development work but uh, i think it gets easier with time because as you mentioned you also the, the more you work on games the more ideas you have stored somewhere you know in the notebooks or in the back of your head so it's getting easier and easier to pull out, you know, old ideas that will fit, you know, this project when they didn't fit uh, the previous game. Um, but um, I, I think for, for me, at least, um, I think I'm working in a more balanced way now. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm still, you know, I can still be, you know, hugely creative and uh, and do a lot of stuff and come up with, with new ideas and stuff like that. But uh, I don't feel the pressure anymore, you know, to um, to do everything and to do everything perfectly. You know, sometimes good enough is just good enough. Uh, it's it's better sometimes to you know to make any choice rather than agonize forever. You know, what choice to make? And um, yeah, we change with time. You know, for example, w- with Crunch, at least for me, it was you know Crunch was fun when it was my first job. So I had a lot of fun crunching at CD right. Project, you know, the first feature, even if and if it meant working during the weekends or 14 hours a day, whatever. It was fun because you know the people were fun, and it was uh, for most of us, it was the the first big game that we were working on. But yeah, you can do that once really, and right. then it's it, it just gets boring and and tedious and and doesn't really add anything to to you know to to game development. So. I think that that's true with with other stuff as well. You know, we we learn what works for us, what doesn't, and we just learn how to be better. Even if that means we are slightly less efficient, we will still be much better than we were. Right, 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 right. Uh, I mean, speaking of of uh, agonizing over choices uh, for for a long period of time, uh, do you? Uh, foresee a lot of really tough calls for players going through the the game growing up (laughs) i think that the players will hate us uh in 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 many ways after playing growing up because there are some really really um evil choices uh, during some of the characters stories that uh, you may not expect you know the outcome to be as bad as it will be when you make that choice. So, uh, but that's life, you know, um, sometimes you do something that you think is, is innocent and 
yeah shouldn't be a problem and that is then it escalates into into some huge argument that can you know end a relationship or a friendship or whatever so there are some situations in the game like that uh and because there is no you know way to just uh reload the game to an earlier save point oh. you are stuck with your choices gotcha. yeah 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 yeah, yeah. That, that that's interesting it's one thing that uh uh my game my game my game knows when you've done it <laughs> when you've save scummed and uh <laughs> it, it 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 reacts to it later on uh, we let players do it, but we we react to it inevitably. Um, yeah, it's it's weird. It, it is a weird phenomena, especially in like narrative and choice based games, where people really want to get the right answer or the good. Yeah. And even yeah. even if it's a like such a open ended <laughs> nebulous thing, they want the good ending. Uh, I mean, is that? Do you think that's just because it's a game and people expect I'm supposed to be able to win this game, or is it? Yeah, is it something else? Yeah, I think it's um, you know because when you look at how people play the games, even games that uh, have little to no story, mm -hmm. uh, like the people tend to try to figure out how to play the game in order to maximize what they get out of it. Uh, even if it's just in-game currency or whatever, they will try to figure out, you know, how the black box that the game is works inside in order to play the game most efficiently. And I think this phenomena, phenomena, uh, because I do it myself mm -hmm. from time to time, that when I'm not sure about, you know, what kind of a story choice to make, I sometimes actually cheat and just check, you know, Wikipedia or... Uh, YouTube just to see what the outcomes are, just to make sure I make the right choice. Um, and I think it it also comes out of it that people want to maximize, you know, the the positive, the good effects that they get while playing the game. Uh, but we sort of made it impossible in growing up. And uh, yeah, it's it was a risky choice. But uh, I'm very curious how people will actually react to that. I'm I'm curious about that. I I I think I think you're right. It is completely human nature. I'm I'm I go total lizard brain with games sometimes. I'll make keyboard macros to just automate some process if I figured out it's going to make yeah. me, you know, like infinity <laughs> currency or whatever. Um but I'm curious how you neutralize that as a designer. That's one thing I've I've, I've never quite figured out and I'm curious if you have any advice on how do you how do you neutralize the player's obsession with victory? Yeah, I think uh there's, you know, a lot of work for me left to do to figure that question out myself, you know, uh Fair enough. in the games I design, uh so far I don't have a solution for that. Um the the ways I've done it so far, uh, yeah. One of one of the ways I did it, you know, in growing up was just to lock out the safe system so that people don't have to, uh, so that people can't really think about, you know, changing their choices. So whatever they do sticks with them till the end of the playthrough. So I'm curious how that goes. Uh, but the other ways I try to sort of limit the the agony of the player, you know, over the choices was to make sure that. Uh, all of the choices end up with interesting results in some of the previous games. But, but that's also not ideal to me because I ended up sort of um, finding out myself, you know, as a designer that I tended to design narratives in such a way that each choice would sort of more or less lead to, you know, good outcomes. So right. it, it was very hard or for me to uh, really commit to it and make a choice that would uh, end, up end up badly. And uh, it also was sort of related to, to the genre of the games uh, that I was previously making because they were casual games. Uh, uh, so it, it it would be very antagonizing, you know, to, to the players to, to do some of the uh, bad choices that uh, we considered. But uh, yeah, so far I don't have a, a good solution to that problem. Maybe Maybe in a couple of, you know, next games we'll see. Right, right. Yeah, it's a. I think it's a. I, I mean, 
I think I think one of the bigger answers is to not try and neutralize it and more like lean into a player's sense of victory and and you know leverage that to your success. It's, it's but it's like that's also something that's really hard to do. Yeah, uh, you know, sometimes the choice uh, is enough uh, just because there is a choice. Mm-hmm. Even if you know that ninety percent of people will choose, you know, option A, that doesn't matter because you are actually giving them the choice, and that that's something that's very important in, right. in you know in storytelling games or branching games just to have this feeling of, of actually making a choice. Even if, you know, both choices lead to the same outcomes or one of the choices you know for sure that almost no one will pick, so. Yeah, I find I find a lot of narrative designers actually are pained a little bit by that. Uh, the the lost or, or buried content problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How, do you, how do you feel about the... The, the the fact that so much good hard work is going to be never never seen except for a, a small, yeah, small, small handful yeah it's a pity you know uh because you know writing stories uh especially branching stories is a lot of work and when you add you know voiceovers to that it's it's a lot of work and a, and a lot of money to you know to get it done mm-hmm. so it's really really painful when you know half of the content you make yeah will not be seen by most of the players and i think mass effect had actually uh, a problem like that because most people just played paragon and uh, not many people played renegade so there is like tons and tons of content lines of dialogue scenes that you know were written for the whole trilogy that a very very small percentage of players will ever experience or see so uh, it's a it's 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 a waste of work, I think, and we should we should try and find ways to to balance it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, even if you know just for the satisfaction of of the de- developers working on the game, because there's there's nothing worse than to feel you know that months of work that you put into a game is not going to be you know seen by anyone. Right. That's heartbreaking, you know. Do you um. I mean, if the answer then is to do less of these incredibly branched, hyper variable experiences and and go more into the uh, AAA style, this is the storyline. Take it or leave it, right? Um, do you think you'd be satisfied as as a designer or or, or dissatisfied? Yeah, I think we we shouldn't go that route, actually. So you know, let's let's keep trying uh, and let's keep making you know branching storytelling games with a lot of story content, uh, and let's just experiment to see you know what in with in what different ways we can tell stories that that give player choice, uh, but also um, make you know asset creation more reasonable for the game. Right, 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 right. Um, that's, I mean, I mean that's, I'm, I, I will probably always just continue burning the candle at both ends and just make as much content as shotgun content into every project yeah. and just, you know, yeah. deal, deal with the pain of it. Um, but that's my style and it's not advisable. Um, yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to tell us about the game uh, as we slowly wind down here? Yeah, it's coming out soon. Uh, we still can't reveal, you know, the exact release date, um, but it will be in 2021. <laughs> That's uh, as much as I can say. We are very, very excited, you know, to to show the game to the people, you know, the full game because so far we've released just the demo, and already, you know, the the reactions, the player reactions, and the feedback we are getting from the players is, is just amazing. People are enjoying the game so much. Um, so yeah, we'd so, so like to, you know, to already show the full game mm-hmm. to everyone. But uh, yeah, it won't take much longer. And I think that the changes that we are still making uh, to the game, actually also based on the feedback we're getting from, from the players, we actually made a, one big change recently that a lot of people requested, you know, on the Discord server. Um, I think the game will be better because of that. Um, and yeah, I, I just hope everyone will enjoy it uh, when it's out. Uh, and I hope, you know, that the stories that we tried to tell will resonate with people, uh, especially since we really, really try to go deep into 
what kind of troubles you can have, you know, as a kid growing up and, you know, with different situations at school. Um, I hope we did, you know, growing up as a human justice. Good. But we'll see. <laughs> right and uh, if people want to see more of the game, there's a, a, a demo available on Steam right now. Yeah. And, uh, and anywhere else they should, they should check, check a look if they want to uh, learn more about it or anything. Yeah, you can join the Discord server. There's a lot of discussion there. I'm actually answering a lot of questions uh, on the Discord server. And uh, there are a couple of other developers from the project there answering questions as well. So yeah, be sure to join uh, the Growing Up Discord and, and join the discussion. We uh, are very eager to hear your feedback, even if it's... Uh, just you know the the feedback relating to the demo. Um, every every piece of feedback and information and opinion counts and is very very important to us. Cool, cool, cool. Well, I want to thank you very very much for coming on. Uh, it was a lot of fun talking about uh, narrative design and life simulation. I very rarely get to uh, <laughs> bat that yeah. topic around. Um, thank and thank you. you for invita inviting me it was no. it was really fun to do it oh it was a pleasure um cool everybody i guess uh we'll sign off for now and i'll see you tomorrow we're gonna do more game dev work all right bye everybody all right bye